Hello and welcome to Walking in the Word. Today we're going to take another step in the relationship that was being forged through Judah and Benjamin. We're going to see how that Judah now can begin to teach his younger brother Benjamin how to rule as king and priest. So Alton, where would you like to start with that? Well, I'd like to kind of review what the Adamic nature is because I feel like the church, especially and in, in out in the world, are real. They don't understand what we're up against. They think if you're good enough that you'll you'll make it somehow. And that's not entirely true. The nature that we're born with cannot stand in the presence of God. And it needs to be dealt with. Jesus dealt with it on the cross. He took all our sinful nature. He was called by Paul the last Adam. Nobody has to be an Adam anymore. But we have to come into his, we'll call it a program, of salvation. How do I get out of this? How do I uh, change? Okay? And it's a spiritual battle. It's not something you can do at the uh, psychiatrist's office. That has to do with the soul realm. But we need to hook up with God again in the spirit realm and then learn how to take on his character into us and get rid of Adam's character. And so, you know, he, he told uh, Adam, you know, you're, you were made out of the dust and dust you're going to return to. Every time he can take something out of me that is a characteristic of me and deal with it and kill it and resurrect who he is in its place, then that part of me that dies goes back into the dust. And who gets to eat the dust, according to Genesis? Satan gets to eat dust. So every time the Lord changes something in me, teaches me how to not be angry, teaches me how to be more compassionate or something that, ch that changes me, I have a motto. I say, Satan, eat my dust. <laughs> and so he wants to change us. He wants to, to get rid of that Adamic nature. So how do we do that? Well, too many, I'm sad to say, church people ignore this. Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Okay, your sins have to be remitted. And then you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And that Holy Ghost is the teacher, the one that's going to, do the changing in you. And, and as you read the word and the Holy Ghost makes it, that word has to become flesh. Okay? That's, the word became flesh and we saw Jesus. Now we, we need to begin to take on who he is. And that's what this whole um, thing that we're talking about is about. Us learning to become sons of his right hand by emulating our brother Jesus. Okay? Everything that Jesus got from the Father, you have a right to. And so it's it's a, it's amazing because he wants to give us so much and we're saying, oh, I'm not worthy or I'm not able when he said go and tarry at Jerusalem until you be endued with dunamis power okay that word dunamis means ability it means possible it means able he in us is what makes us 
Abel. Okay. David knew he wasn't able to go up against the guy, the giant in the natural. But he didn't. This was a spiritual battle. If you want to get technical, Goliath brought a knife to a gunfight. <laughs> and he was outclassed before he even started. And he knew it. That's why he had all that extra stuff. Satan knows who he's fighting. And he's trying his hardest. And he goes overboard and overplays his hand a lot of times. Let's heat that furnace up seven times hotter. Why? One time's plenty. But he knew God could deliver them. And, you know, throwing Daniel in the lion's den. Why do that? They could have just executed him if they wanted to get rid of him. And he always does that, but he finds out God's more powerful. And so, when we talk about the Adamic nature, we don't realize sometimes <clears throat> we see it, but we don't recognize it, and we so then we don't deal with it. I ask people all the time that have children, did you have to teach that child how to say no? No, you didn't. It came naturally. When they don't want to do something, no. When they get their hand caught in their cookie jar, did you have to teach them to, to lie why they're, they're doing something you told them not to do? No. They will come up with the most ridiculous excuse, and they believe it. That's the thing. We believe the excuses we make. But God sees through it. So no use doing that. And, and then there's the blame game. As soon as the Lord said to Adam, where are you? Well, I'm hiding. Why are you hiding? Because I'm naked. Who said you're naked? What have you done? He didn't ask, what did Eve do? What did the devil do? He said, what have you done? And right away, he throws his wife under the bus. That woman, and then... He's going to blame God, too, that you gave me. Okay, I didn't ask for her. You gave her to me, and now look what happened. No, he made a conscious choice to disobey God. And so that's, that's part of who we start out as. And it's not enough to try to be good. We have to deal with it. It has to be killed. It has to be destroyed. There can't be one little finger of it wiggling left. Okay? And that happens in baptism. In, a, in a, oh, I guess it would be Colossians 2. It talks about <clears throat> that you're buried with him and then you're raised up in a newness of life. And it became, and it's a, it's a spiritual circumcision, okay, in the cutting away of the flesh of the heart, the sinful flesh. And so it's the modern day covenant that Abraham would have had done in the flesh of circumcision. And it, if you want to be an Israelite, you had to go through that. You did not have any rights to any of the feasts or anything, unless you came into that covenant. This is the new covenant. And it says, if you repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and the promise is you'll get the Holy Ghost. A lot of people say, I got the Holy Ghost, and I didn't get baptized. So did Cornelius. But the very next thing was, Peter said, who can forbid water? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Okay? That's how important it is. You will always come up short because you don't have the tools that God wants to give you. And you can get by, but you notice that Holy Ghost comes and goes and comes and goes. It's not supposed to come and go. It's supposed to come and stay. It's going to be a difference. In the Old Testament, you can take Samson as an example. 
the spirit would come on him, he'd do great things, and then he'd go back. God wants us to stay in the spirit continually. He wants it to indwell in us. And that's the difference between it coming and going and coming and going. It's inside of you now. And so we need that. We need that to be able to function day by day and keep moving on in this program of his salvation. He that endures to the end or perfection or the goal or completion, whatever you want to call it, shall be saved. Okay? It's not a one-shot thing. I said a prayer and it's done. If it was, that whole thick Bible would be this big, one page. <laughs> That's all you would need. So there must be something more to it. And whenever you think you've had enough, or that you're good enough, forget it. There's always more. There's always going to be more. When the age is over and you think you're going to go to heaven or whatever you, you want to believe, there's still going to be more. If everything in this Bible was fulfilled right now, there's still going to be more. It just doesn't run into a dead end. It will always get better. And so, you know, um, God wants us to get sin out of our life. And a lot of people say, well, that's impossible. You're going to sin till you die. Well, that's going to cause you to die. Sin and death go together. And so, <clears throat> they stood on the banks of the Jordan River and said, we can't possess the land because there's giants in there. That land is you, your life, your soul. Okay? If you say you can't conquer sin, then you're standing on that bank with them saying we can't go in. Joshua and Caleb were of a different spirit. They said, we're more than able. There's that word able, dunamis, in the Greek. We're more than able to go and take this country. You and I are more than able with Jesus. Okay? That's why we have to cultivate this relationship with the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And we have the potential to be son of the right hand, Benjamin. Okay, In, in John, first chapter of John, it says that he came to his own and his own received him not. But as many as received him, gave he the power, the exousia, the authority to become a son of God. Okay? What does it take to become a son of God? Well, you have to listen to the Father and let him raise you up and groom you to take over the company, the family business. And so you're, you're going to the old saying, I'm going to be a chip off the old block. Okay? You're going to have the same DNA that Jesus had in the Father. And won't that be something? That you can claim that heritage, that, that lineage, that you are part of the lineage of God. And you are his son. Don't let that gender stuff throw you, ladies. You can be a son. Of, he expects you to be a son, too. And take on all the characteristics of Jesus. In Hebrews, it says that he was the express image of the Father. And that word is the Greek word character, which we get our word character from. We're going to be the exact character of the Father. And, you know, you just can't uh, buy that. You just can't conjure it up. 
just because you want it. You have to allow him to work it into you and and you become. And it says, let there be light. Let there become light. If you want to be a son of God, you are going to have to become a son of God. And so, I'm going to let my lovely wife take over. She has something to say about this. I would like to pick up with the idea of <clears throat> king and priest anointings that we see in the Old Testament. Abraham, if you remember, gave offerings to Melchizedek, who was functioning as both king and priest at that time. And then if you fast forward in time, all of the men between Abraham, actually between Noah and, and David, all of them performed priestly functions. They sacrificed on behalf of their people, and offerings and such. But when we come to the time of David, we see a man who basically spans Old Covenant and new in the realm of relationship and worship to his God. This, the story of David building or erecting a tent and putting the Ark of the Covenant in it. It was known as the Tabernacle of David. David was addicted, you could say, to the presence of Jehovah God. He was addicted to worshiping the God who had made himself known to him in a very intimate, special way. So David functioned as both king and priest. He ushered in the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem and put it in a special place so that Worship would go 24 hours before the Ark of the Covenant. And so that was an, an awesome thing. So David functioned as both king and priest, but now notice something. David, who was the son-in-law of Saul, Saul gave David his daughter Michael as wife. David, of the tribe of Judah, Judah the kingly tribe, was the son-in-law of the present king, Saul, who, guess what, was a Benjamite. And if you follow the relationship of David and Saul, there are very interesting things that interplay between the two men. Saul was not given the moniker that God gave David of, he's a man after my own heart. And David certainly was a man who was always pursuing the heart of God. Even though he wasn't a perfect man, he made plenty of mistakes. But he was always pursuing the heart of God. Saul, on the other hand, became very jealous of David. And so even though David was the younger, Saul was the older, we see a living example of David being a Judah, a, of the tribe of Judah basically providing an example for a Benjamite, his own king, his own father-in-law, Saul, of how one should respond and how one should act in accordance with being the one that can mentor. So you follow that relationship throughout and you see that David grew. He grew in favor with God and man. He grew as a warrior, defeating the enemies of Israel. He really did bring a, a good example of what God had told Judah he would become prophetically. And then Benjamin had to learn and watch and, and grow through that, through that situation. Always remember that Judah and Benjamin were brothers, and Judah as we see in the life of David, became known as one who was after God's heart. In Psalms 103, we see a very interesting verse, verse 7, that mentions two principles. And it reads, He, God, made known his ways to Moses. And this is David writing this, this verse. God made his ways known to Moses, and his acts 
to the sons of Israel. And so here's a, a question for you. What is the difference between knowing someone's ways and knowing their acts? In modern day terminology, we, we could think of this. If I were to read someone's resume, I would know their acts. But would that mean that I know their ways? No, that comes through personal relationship. And so David knew the ways of God. Moses knew the ways of God because he had a personal relationship with the creator of the universe, Jehovah God. And David, who passionately worshipped his God, knew the ways of God. God desires for us not just to know his acts. People who aren't even believers can know the acts of God. They can hear messages and stories of miraculous interventions, but that doesn't mean that they know him intimately, that they know his ways. God is always pursuing our hearts, and he desires for us to pursue his. And so David, acting as both king and priest, stood in this place of knowing and worshiping the, the God and of the universe and knowing his ways. In the book of Revelation, chapter 5, the 24 elders we see in verse 10 sang a song before the Lamb of God in heaven. You made us kings and priests to our God, and we will reign over the earth. Well, the first earth that you and I have to learn how to reign over, and David began to understand this, is, is we have to learn how to reign over the earth that we are. We are vessels made of clay. So as Alton has alluded to the Adamic nature, we have to learn how to deal with Adam, the Adam in us, before we can think of any outward reigning or possession or taking, taking possession of, of things here in the earth that we dwell in outside of ourselves. So possessing our land starts with knowing God's heart for humanity, knowing his heart for us. What is it he's destined for us to do? Well, David, again, referring to David, in Psalms 23, verse 3, reveals the heart of God in one aspect. He says in verse 3, he restored, God restores my soul. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. How precious that God's desire, first of all, is to restore every part of us. Zouten said to get rid of every evidence of Adam and replace it with who he is. That's his desire, his character, his nature in us instead. The word restore in Psalms 23.3, the definition means to deliver. But now look at this. It means also to recover or to bring home again. Think back to what Alton said about Adam and Eve in the garden. Before they rebelled against God, they walked in union and in balance with God daily. They walked with God in the cool of the evening. He would come and he would commune. He would talk with them. Once Adam fell and sold all of humanity into sin, then we have this, this battle that without the power of God, is not able to be one. So when he rejected God's plan in the garden, then their souls were no longer governed by the knowledge and the presence of God. Luke 21, verse 19, makes an interesting statement. It says, in your patience, and the, the reference is to us, you, in your patience, possess your souls. You think, well, I was made spirit, soul, and body, so I guess I possess my soul. No, that's not the case. As long as there's evidence of Adam's nature in us, we do not possess our own souls. Our souls are manipulated and driven by forces that are not the nature of God. So he says, in your patience, if you look up the word, it means endurance. In your endurance, in other words, don't give up. 
don't say, well, I was born this way, I can't change, my mother was like this, my father was like this, it's just how I am. No. You're not of this, you're not a son of Adam. If you've been born again, you've been baptized and circumcised in Jesus' name for the remission of your sins, then you are no longer a son of Adam. You're now a son of God who's learning how to possess your soul in your endurance. The Amplified says of Luke 21, 19, endurance empowered by the Holy Spirit, that Spirit of God living within you, gives you the power to possess your souls, to overcome the things that are not Christ-like. 2 Corinthians 3, 18 makes a statement that we are changed into the same image. Again, not being God, but learning how to talk like him and act like him. Changed into the same image from glory to glory, from one degree of being more Christ-like to the next degree of being more Christ-like in our soul, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. And then Alton kind of alluded to the the principle in 1 Peter 1.9, it says, obtaining the end of your faith, even the salvation of your soul. So you may be asking, what does that mean? I'm not saved. I'm not going to heaven when I die if I don't possess my soul fully. I didn't say that. The end of our faith. In other words, the definition of the word end, very small word, three-letter word, means the completion or the point aimed at. In other words, the purpose of your faith in God should be, should be the obtaining or the possessing the full salvation of your soul. The word salvation, we've talked many times about the word sozo in the Greek that it comes from. It means to be delivered, to be preserved, to be safe, to be made whole, to be made whole. 6,000 years of the effect of sin has caused none of us to be whole. And so we have, we have work that God needs to do in us, and we just have to yield to that. Let him bring a completion. The word perfect throws people. It simply means to be complete or to be made whole. That's what the word perfect means in Scripture. Obtaining the end, 1 Peter 1, the point aimed at of your faith, even the salvation of your soul. So if we were to go back up to Psalms 23 in verse 3 where David said, God restores my soul. It's something he desires, he longs to do. The word restore, if you remember the definition, means to bring back home. To bring back home to where man was before the fall. God's realm of restoration is always, always better than before. Adam and Eve did not have the indwelling spirit of God. They had an outside voice of God. But God's desire is in this new covenant that we live in. The Spirit of God lives within us. That's restoration better than the original in, in Adam and Eve even had. So God has given us a commission to fulfill, and that is in your patience, possess your soul. That takes the kingly and the priestly function and the authority before God to rule and reign over our own lives, our own selves. And God has given us the lion of the tribe of, of Judah to walk with us to make this possible as we walk daily with Jesus who is the word. We know his heart through the word of God that we read. We know how, how he desires for us to be. So Benjamin had victories and he had setbacks in the process throughout the generations that followed him, but his progress and his mentoring relationship with his older brother Judah, and by the way, Jesus calls himself our, our older brother. So he, had, he's, he is mentoring us through his word. His progress, Benjamin, serves as a reminder that we can possess our land, our soul, through the empowering of the Holy Spirit. So we thank you today for joining us for this time. We pray that this word has blessed and encouraged you, and we send our love to you in Jesus' name.
innocent speculation This has always been his plan The ark of God had been hidden In one man's house many days Though this man received a blessing God's presence was to be shared. David had a commission to restore the ark of God to its rightful place now Truth and mercy are required. A corporate man will be set there to take his place as God desired. Taking orders from the head himself will govern. This 
This has always been his plan.